Hello, everyone, and welcome to Behind the Curtain for our upcoming concert, Opera in the Outfield. Uh, joining me today is uh, head of music of Minnesota Opera, Alan Periello. Alan, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you, Pablo? Pretty good, pretty good. Enjoying the slightly warmer weather now after a week of cold. It felt like we were almost in fall already. I know, I was getting worried that we weren't going to be very comfortable sitting in the outfield, but I'm a little more hopeful now with uh, the weather this week that we'll have some really lovely weather to sit under the stars and uh, take in the Jumbotron performance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for those of you who don't know, Opera in the Outfield will be an outdoor concert uh, in CHS Field in downtown St. Paul. Uh, the concert will happen on September 24th and the 26th at 7.30 p.m. Or if you uh, would rather watch from home, the stream will be available also from the 27th uh, and will be available on demand for two weeks after that. Um, so, Alan, you are head of music of Minnesota Opera. Um, that is not a title that we get in most industries. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what, like, what does it mean to be head of music for an opera company? Yeah, in uh, my background, I'm a pianist and vocal coach. And often that's um, the background coming into somebody that has this kind of position. And I'm overseeing um, the musical execution of everything that we do, whether it's in our main stage productions or uh, concerts we're doing in the community, um, repertoire that's programmed as part, um, as events around our productions, um, overseeing the selection of that and the process of preparing it and the ultimate execution of it all. Uh, often it might mean I'll be in a room with a singer, uh, coaching them for that ultimate performance or that presentation. And um, before that, there's a lot of administrative work in working with the team here at the company and what repertoire we program and the timeline for getting that ready. So all aspects of what you hear musically, making sure that we're bringing it at the highest quality we can. Fantastic, fantastic. And so when you and I were talking about what we, what we were gonna discuss today in this Behind the Curtain, um, it's been a bit of a hiatus since we last did any sort of educational or even performances um, for Minnesota Opera. So we thought it would be a neat idea to kind of do a, a welcome back to the opera, kind of intro back to the basics kind of uh, discussion here. So let's, let's get right to it. So what is opera? It's one of those questions, it's like, what is the meaning of life, right? Like, what actually, is there an answer to this question? There, because there's so many things that it is. Um, and um, there's so many things, there's more things that it is than it's not, really, I find. Um, I think if you try to make a list of what isn't opera, you're not going to come up with a lot of definitive options. Um, but in general, the, the word opera is also the word for work, right? Mm -hmm. um, a work. And yeah, for um, most people who don't know, uh, opera is the plural of opus. So you might might have heard the word opus referring to uh, a masterwork of music or something like that. So stereotypically, what you would see most often with the term opera um, are pieces that are performed in a theater with an orchestra in the pit and singers on stage, potentially with a chorus as well, um, presenting um, a dramatization of a piece that's been put together, hopefully brilliantly, by a libretto, a librettist and composer, and um, telling that story on a scale um, that requires so much collaboration to bring it to life, from the folks you see on stage, uh, to the conductor, to the director, the players in the pit, and all of um, the chorus, the crew, the stage management team, uh, the costume shop. I mean, there's just so many teams that are going in to put together this cohesive storytelling on a stage. Uh, more often than not, it means singers are singing unamplified, though there are operas that require amplification. More often than not, the pieces are entirely sung 
but there's exceptions to that as well because there are uh, there's dialogue in some operas. Um, but uh, I'd say with more often than not acoustic instruments in the pit with unamplified singing, um, bringing these um, big emotions and these big stories or small stories or small emotions to life as well. They're on all scales. There's chamber opera and there's grand opera and there's everything in between. Yeah, one I think you're, you're touching on a very, uh, kind of a central feature of this is that the story is kind of at the center of things, right? Um, yeah. For, uh, for those of you who don't know, I work a lot with uh, school-aged uh, kids and often, more often than not, I, I end up trying to simplify the, the definition as much as possible. So what I always tell my students is opera at its core is stories told through singing. Of course, we know that it involves so much more like Alan just uh, told us. Um, now, in this concert, Opera in the Outfield, we're gonna get a wide array of uh, different types of pieces from different time periods and all of those things. Um, how would you say that opera has kind of evolved from its beginnings, um, say like 400 plus years ago, to kind of where opera is now today? I think uh, in the last, I guess if we look at 150 years, we've seen how the art, how big the art form can be. Um, mm -hmm. Because it started very small um, with often in smaller theaters in Europe with smaller orchestras and smaller casts um, and often pieces of great length. Um, I think we found um, the farther we've moved ahead, we've seen it stretch to how big can that orchestra be and how big can those horses be? Um, but there's also been a bit of a swing back recently um, with, with chamber, um, uh, chamber operas that tell stories with a small amount of players and a small amount of singers uh, that can be done in a wide variety of spaces, um, not necessarily the two, three, four thousand seat theater that you might see some pieces, but things that are really meant to um, be experienced in a black box or um, in a found space, a space that you might not typically associate with a live performance. And I think as we are in uh, the COVID era right now um, and being in theaters um, is challenging, if not prohibited. Um, <laughs> opera is exploring ways, um, again, to see where can we take it? Where can we go with it? It's different companies in different places have done that on different scales, but all places of all scales are having to look at that now about how we continue to tell stories through music um, in ways that we can safely connect with people who um, want to hear these stories and hear this music. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, sometimes when, when you have these kind of restrictions is where kind of creativity can kind of flourish, you know? Um, so tell us a little bit more about this specific concert of Opera in the Outfield. What, what should people expect? What are they going to hear? How are they going to hear it? Uh, tell us a little bit more. Sure. I think the first thing to make really clear is it's a fully pre-recorded concert. Um, what you will experience is basically a telecast on the Jumbotron at the theater of all of these elements that we've been putting together over the last few weeks. Um, you're going to hear excerpts from some of the great classic operas. You're going to hear um, excerpts from some newer operas, pieces that have been premiered in recent years, um, including The Fix, um, which was premiered in Minnesota Opera. Um, just two seasons ago now. Mm -hmm. And I think the location is apt because the story is about the 1919 uh, World Series gambling scandal. Mm -hmm. And so to be bringing some of that baseball story to life at a baseball stadium is pretty great. Yeah. Um, and I know Joel Puckett, the composer, and Eric Simonson, the librettist and original stage director, are really excited that um, the piece won't just be heard in the Ordway like it was, but now sometime at a baseball stadium. <laughs> um, and also exploring um, pieces of all perspectives and all uh, different stories that we might not be 
terribly familiar yet. There's an excerpt uh, from a very recent premiere of Blue by Janine Tesori and Tessel Thompson. And there is also an excerpt um, from Scott Joplin's opera, Trimonisha, um, featuring the Steele family singers and a great way to expose our audience to those pieces that they might not be familiar with yet. Um, and putting all of this together to give those that come to the ballpark or watch the stream um, the opportunity to experience all the, fa all the different facets of opera. Um, not all, but many of them, because there are so many more than we can do in our yeah. nine inning format with this concert. <laughs> um, but to go from the Marriage of Figaro Overture um, to some favorite arias from Lucia uh, di Lamamore to Romeo and Juliet, uh, all kinds of great music that you'll be tapping your toe to because you're familiar with it and you love hearing it again, to things that um, I think our audience will be really excited to hear for the first time. Yeah. So you mentioned the, the unique aspect of it is that it's actually all pre-recorded, but here's what that kind of got me to think is we can pre-record all together, right? So how, how did that kind of work out from a logistics standpoint of recording all of these different instruments and singers and all of those uh, elements of this performance uh, and then kind of bringing them all together? you could probably make a multi-hour documentary out of the process of putting this concert together. Uh, but to be brief for our time, um, <laughs> the first element to get recorded um, was the orchestra. And right now it is not safe to have a full orchestra in a room together, uh, considering many of our players are wind instruments that are creating aerosols and as the uh, virus travels through the air, we have to be really careful with um, both singing and with um, instrumental playing and how we can still perform or record in safe ways. So we broke the orchestra up into three segments and they each had three rehearsals um, where within that was the time to be playing together, work with the conductor Lydia Yankovskaya in shaping the music and then transitioning into making the recordings. So the first group were the strings and the harp, all players that can play with a mask on. And because they are not creating aerosols and they're playing, um, they were kept at a safe distance, but not necessarily the same amount of distance that we would have had to do with the winds and the brass later. Okay. And we used uh, the strings and the harp as setting the bass track of recording. Um, just shortly before that, as our resident artist singers were beginning their contract and starting their coachings on the repertoire, they were able to make recordings of basically a general guideline of what tempos they were hoping for and uh, how transitions would work uh, because we couldn't have the singers in the room with the orchestra. And we needed to set those orchestra layers first in the way that the calendar worked. Uh, so incredibly complicated, yeah. um, but we made it work quite well where we set, uh, made recordings of the strings. And then the next group was the woodwinds, our eight players there. So flute, clarinets, oboes and bassoons. And they had headphones that were connected into the recording engineer, John Scherf's setup uh, to be able to have headphones on and hear the string track. The conductor also had her headphones on and with some counting that was added as a layer over top, as well as hearing the strings, they could get used to the tempi that were set and playing along with that. Um, wow. So then th that woodwind layer was added on top. And then we also had the brass and percussion together as another segment for their three rehearsals. So the trumpets, trombones, French horns, and uh, our two percussionists. And they also had their headphones on. And as you can imagine, we had to have their level up a bit more in their headphones because yeah. brass instruments make a <laughs> lot of sound um, for them to be able to hear that string track. Um, and then with the magic of our recording engineer, John Scherf, uh, he and I worked together at putting those layers together and lining everything up and making sure that the attacks uh, were, were right on, that um, all of the segments were 
that we were choosing the best of each take we had. And I think one thing we were really working with was when you hear, like for the winds and the brass, when you hear the other group in your ear, your tendency is to wait just a millisecond to hear that and respond to that. So often when we were putting things back together, the winds and the brass were just a, a little bit behind. But with the magic of the recording engineer, he could just back up the entirety of that track okay. to line right up. Um, so then we set that information and then the singers were able to begin getting used to that orchestra sound. And then each singer recorded individually on their own, either here in our building or at home. And they too had the headphones on I was in the room to help do a little bit of conducting or help listen more closely to the counting that we had added in there. Because let's face it, when you're a singer that is um, ecstatically on a high note, sometimes <laughs> it's hard to hear what else is going on around you. And yeah. having that visual element that they're used to from when they're on stage and the conductors in the pit was really helpful in, okay, we're gonna get off that high note now or watch this, the music speeding up a little bit or we gotta relax. Um, we would listen like to really, really intricate karaoke is what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and we had to be really specific. Celeste Johnson, who's our resident artist pianist and I, we had to be very specific in the coaching about making sure that for anything that would be an ensemble, that you really have to be diligent about putting that final consonant there or taking the breath here. Um, and because you can't be in the room hearing each other at the same time. You have to go off of this is the plan, stick to the plan. Yeah. Um, because there were a few times where we would get through a take of something and be like, everything was great, except this final consonant was just <laughs> half a beat early and we need it to be later. So it doesn't sound like T -t 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 <laughs> for everybody there. Um, and you're going to so hear that, that in stadium speakers. So yes, you're going to hear the that like, around it. loud yeah. and clear. <laughs> yeah. And then on top of that, also our chorus, um, the Brindisi from La Traviata and the Toreador song from Carmen also involve members of our chorus and they're all recording at home one at a time. Uh, Andrew Whitfield, our chorus master, did terrific work putting together a click track with also a tutorial video of the same kind of thing. This is where we breathe. This is how we line, match our vowels. This is where we put our consonants. And then he mixed all of that together. And with all of that, we put together the forces <laughs> of what is probably close to um, 70, 70 people between the orchestra, the soloists, and the chorus. I'll need to check the math on exactly how many performers we have in this concert. Yeah. Um, but we're now in the final stages of editing the audio and making sure everything is really well polished. And then there's, of course, with any opera, there's the musical element, but there's also a visual element. Mm -hmm. And David Toro and David Murakami um, are working together on directing what you will see on the screen. Okay. And it will be a mix of B-roll footage of the singers and the orchestra as they were recording with newly created material, as well as imagery from pre-existing productions. Some of it will be a bit nostalgic in how uh, you might hear an aria from Romeo and Juliet, and you'll see images from the last time that the company did it. Uh, same with Don Pasquale. And some imagery that will also just be reflective of the music that you're hearing, while also seeing what it was like to be behind the scenes putting this together. We'll also have super titles on the screen, similarly to how we would have them above the stage for any of the foreign language selections. So you won't miss a beat, you won't miss a word in understanding mm -hmm. Uh, the stories that are being told on the giant jumbotron screen. Yeah, yeah. No need for opera glasses here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, and I mean, you're already sort of talking about this a little bit, but you know, in we are now in in deep into COVID times. Um, how have you seen? Um, I guess not only even Minnesota opera, but just the opera industry in general, like. What changes have you seen? How are you seeing people kind of adapt or try new things or anything like that? Or... Sure. In the very immediate for this concert is all the protocols around how we were able to do all of this safely. Because yeah. uh, that was taken 
very seriously as it needs to be um, with everybody receiving a health check, um, having their temperature taken as they come in the building to clear signage about which way to go and which way you can't go in the building, um, what rooms you have access to and what you don't, um, accommodations for air ventilation, some of the breaks or the breaks we would have in the orchestra rehearsals, uh, everybody had to be out of the room for at least 20 minutes to allow the air to fully circulate before bringing folks back in. Um, and if you aren't a singer or you aren't playing a woodwind or brass instrument, you have to have your mask on at all times. Um, and then all of the disinfecting <laughs> liquid the, and hand sanitizer around our building to keep everybody safe. So that's been, of course, a major um, adaption we're having to do to make this work. And I'd say it's going really, really well. Yeah. Um, there's really good protocols in place. Um, and even right now, you know, you're, you're recording from the Opera Center where our full-time staff is still not in our building. Um, we have, and we haven't been for six months now, somewhere around there. Like, yeah. We have not stepped foot in that building since early March or something like that. <laughs> right. You know, coming back in three weeks ago as we started the orchestra work was my first time in the building in a very long time. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm here in the building today because we are doing in-person work with our resident artists. And uh, it's very quiet around the building. Yeah. Um, but we are continuing to look as our company and all companies at how we stay connected um, with the stories that we love and telling the stories that we love, the music that we love, and the community of people that love what we do, as we also continue to look to expand our community and um, include people um, that might not necessarily have known about opera or uh, known that it could be for them as well. Um, so of course there's a lot of digital engagement because that's what we have. Um, so like we're doing today, this event um, would normally be an in-person event, but we're recording it to share uh, with our beloved patrons. Um, Although I do miss and, the coffee and cookies that would normally be in this event. You know? I know, right? Maybe we'll just need to mail everybody cookies or something. Right? Yourself, but... <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll go get <laughs> some myself later. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're definitely all thinking about, um, as we hope that we can move back into theaters, at what scale can we do that? What kind of pieces um, can we tell that are stories that we do want to share and music that we want to perform, um, while also at a scale that is safe for the performers and for the audience? So there's a lot of looking at, um, at those smaller pieces. Some of it is looking very far to the past where the scale had been smaller and there are great pieces in the repertoire that perhaps we've ignored for a little while. And there's also things that are very contemporary about um, issues today um, that are very new to today and others that um, are not necessarily new issues but are finally being addressed in an operatic um, platform. So, and that's a big part of, you know, what Minnesota Opera strives to do. The, the vision statement of the company is to sing every story. So this, this is certainly a, a, a part of that for sure, right? Absolutely. And there's, by stripping down sometimes so much of what you see under the lights and the costume and lots of people, um, we're looking at um, ways, particularly with our resident artists this season too, at how can we find things that are really meaningful for them um, to share in their storytelling. Um, and we have the time and space to look at that differently than how it often is where you are fulfilling this role in this production on a grand scale that the company is performing at the Ord way. So yeah. keep an eye and an ear out for what our new wonderful group of artists are going to come up with this season. Absolutely. And I mean, it, it, it really does make you think about like, what, uh, what can artist development look like when you can't be in a production? Um, Absolutely. That's, that's definitely something that, um, I mean, we're looking at kind of in, in every level. I mean, your, your most immediate uh, contact with that is with the resident artists. Um, and then our, our, 
uh, education programs with uh, Project Opera and uh, Music Out Loud and all of these uh, different programs, we're all kind of looking at this like in an, under a similar light of like, okay, we, we can't do recitals, we can't do um, regular productions where that's, I mean, that's invaluable experience. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about like just what what you have kind of on the slate for for the resident artists this year since they can't be in the productions? Right. So the resident artist program, for those that might not be familiar with it, we've talked about it a few times now. Um, this year is a cohort of eight individuals who are on a full-time seasonal contract from September through May. And they are singers, a pianist, a stage director, and an assistant technical director who have all completed their academic um, studies. Um, and we're, we are helping bridge the gap um, between finishing their academic studies and moving into a professional career or a freelance career in whichever aspect um, that they hope to, whatever direction they hope to go with it. Mm -hmm. um, so for, for um, these artists, often they're gaining experience in our productions um, that are at that next level up from what they were able to do in their academic institutions and connecting them to folks in the opera sphere um, that, are gonna, that are excited by their artistry and will want to give them chances um, to, to continue performing and continue working after their time in the program here. Um, that is still very much our goal, is to be that, uh, be that bridge and prepare them for what lies ahead. We also don't know completely what lies ahead, but we are, we are helping um, in coaching, in, less, in voice lessons, in classes, um, in discussions with our staff, and in um, opportunities to connect globally with people around the world because of the power of Zoom. Um, to keep them really in the loop about where are we going and what, what things will stay the same in some ways and what things will change and how, how can they best continue to prepare themselves for that. So as we look at repertoire that they can be working on and recording, we want them to have a really great looking output um, in their materials, whether it's websites or social media or what the company is sharing and helping them explore um, what makes, continue to explore what makes them distinctly their own artist. What is most exciting about them? What do they have to share that is unique uh, to themselves? And sometimes it is trying out some arias that they thought they weren't ready for yet or using a part of their voice in a different way that they had never tried before to exploring characters that they've never dug into. Um, you know, maybe, maybe they've played a lot of comic roles, but they haven't played what you might consider to be uh, the bad guy or the bad girl or you know, any of those, um, those kinds of characters that might be telling a story through repertoire that is suitable for their voice. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to be very present and we're also trying to look ahead and wonder continuing to twist around that crystal ball and see what might uh, what might lie ahead yeah. um, and looking to make these these resident artists feel really a part of the minnesota opera community and part of the twin cities and our state's performing community um, so that once they leave we hopefully have opportunities to bring them back and that they are familiar to our audiences and our patrons um, our board members, to our staff, um, as people that we really enjoy what they have to offer in their artistry and offer them opportunities to continue to do that here. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, two questions before we kind of wrap up. Um, the first one is what, what, what are you most excited about in this Opera and Outfield concert? Um, is it a, like a, a particular selection, a part of the process, or what excites you about this concert? I'm excited um, 
that we can use this concert to introduce this year's group of resident artists. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, two returning and six new artists this year. And this will be normally the first big opportunity to get to experience their artistry is on the Ordway stage. But this time it's gonna be on the Jumbotron and I'm excited for people to hear these voices and uh, see the work and hear the work of our, our team in a way that hopefully gets them really excited about who's with us this season. And I also am really excited that we're going full on into the baseball theme. The mm -hmm. concert takes on a nine inning format. Um, there's a mix of the recorded performances as well as some interviews and some back and forth between some teams and mm -hmm. um, answering some questions. Um, so trying to make it a real fun interactive experience. There will be uh, two sing-along opportunities for the audience, which I'm really excited mm -hmm. about. Uh, and because often the audience doesn't really get to participate when they're at the Ordway other than enjoying what they're hearing and offering their applause and their bravos at the curtain call. Um, but this is everybody come and have a great time. Um, get your food at the concession stand. Enjoy um, being outdoors as long as we can before it gets too cold. Right. And um, <laughs> but again, it's something such a wonderful mix of repertoire um, of things that are familiar, things that are new, um, and hoping to expand um, the buffet <laughs> that is opera uh, to whoever comes. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm especially excited about the Trimonisha selection and yeah. the Blue selections, for sure. Me too. Um, I, both both titles that have been kind of floating around uh, in, in the seasons. Um, I mean, this one that would have happened differently had COVID not uh, thrown a wrench into the, the plans. Um, but yeah, I'm excited about those two selections. Um, okay, so last last question we'll we'll leave off uh, from here. Uh, anyone who knows me or who's been kind of stuck in conversations with me knows that I really like to do uh, big questions, big philosophical questions or big thinking questions. Um, so my big question for you is, what is the role of art in a global pand pandemic? Big question. <laughs> um, and this is just, you know, your thoughts, not, not necessarily I know. everyone's opinion. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, this is something we all should be thinking about. Yeah. Um, I think art itself is the noun. And it, um, what, what are the the actions or the verbs around art, um, I think are the things that we can really talk about. Um, the performance of the discussion around, um, the listening to, um, the ways that we engage with art can continue to keep us connected. Um, it can give us hope. Um, it can challenge the ways we think about things. Um, it can, encourage us to think about things we've never thought about before. Um, it can give us the opportunity to grapple with really tough things. And we're grappling with a lot of tough things right now. Yeah, we and <laughs> um, I think that's going to lead to some really, really positive and necessary changes throughout our world in all aspects. And and I very much hope, and I'm seeing it happen in our operatic sphere, in how we look at who's in our audience, who's on our stage, who's, um, who, gets, who gets access to what should be something that is accessible to all, mm -hmm. um, whether it is opportunities to work in the industry or to, to experience the works that are performed um, by companies in this industry. Um, but we've talked about this before, that art is for all. And um, while there are different restrictions in how we can connect with everybody right now, um, it should be taken as an opportunity um, to do all of those things that I was just talking about and how um, 
what we do around art to make this a better place, make this world a better place for all of us um, and to help everybody um, express themselves, um, to be heard, to be seen. And um, by taking, by experiencing other people's stories, we can look at our own stories and hope to make our own story and everybody else's stories a better story. Beautifully said. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you again for, for chatting with me for this uh, half hour, 45 minutes, somewhere around there. Um, I really appreciate your, your perspective. I appreciate the work that you've done to put this concert together and sharing a little bit about, about what uh, folks should expect when they either come see the performance itself on September 24th or the 26th at 7.30 at CHS Field, or whether they choose to experience this at home uh, from the 27th for two weeks onward, uh, where they can access this program on demand. So thank you again, Alan, and we hope to see everyone at Opera in the Outfield. Oh, 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 oh.